In this video, I want to discuss the notion of groupthink as a concept of defective group decision making or not effective group decision making and something to be avoided. So this concept of groupthink comes to us from a gentleman named Irving Janus, who's a sociologist who back in the late 70s and early 80s started thinking about these major blunders in historical decision making. We're talking about things like Pearl Harbor and the, and the actions that led to the, the possibility that that might happen and, and the Bay of Pigs invasion in the 60s and the, and the Watergate scandal in the 70s and, and then of course Vietnam War in general, just the, the blunders that took place that led us to these types of things. And, and Jana started to think, you know, the sociologist, he started to think, what is wrong with these people? Are these the people whose moms, when they said, well, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it? Are these the people who said, yeah, I'd jump off there with them? And, and is that how we got here, that they all just kind of ran off the same cliff? And he started thinking, what is wrong with these people? And he, he came up with this concept that he called groupthink. And groupthink defined is this. It's a mode of thinking that people engage in when they're deeply involved in a cohesive in-group, when the members' strivings for unanimity override their motivation to realistically appraise alternative courses of action. So basically, you know, we've got these people that all start moving in the same direction so uh, with so much momentum and speed and things that they never really stop to consider, is this the right thing to do? Is this the best thing to do? Are there other ways that we could approach this? And so the pendulum, the momentum swings so far to that end of things that they all end up rushing off the cliff together or falling off the cliff together, however you want to put it. Uh, and so this is the, the definition of what Irving Janus came up with in 1982 in a study uh, that he came up with, and he termed groupthink. So uh, this is where we're headed with our discussion today. So first of all, let's think about what are the conditions for groupthink. And I think of groupthink like a tornado. They have a lot in common, to be honest. Uh, first of all, they're both very destructive. Tornadoes and, and groupthink can both be very, very destructive. But also it takes very specific conditions and almost miraculous conditions for these things to kind of... Uh, come into being. Tornadoes are created by, I mean, they have to have very specific conditions. They don't just come out of nowhere. They come with these very specific conditions and hot air and cold air mixing together and these, the creating this wind tunnel thing. So, I mean, they're very specific conditions. And groupthink is the same way. It has very specific conditions that need to be in place for it to exist. Really, we're looking here at cohesiveness and concurrence seeking. These are the two conditions that need to be in place. So we have to have a group that's very, very cohesive, uh, which is, you know, an interesting. It's a double-edged sword, cohesiveness is, because cohesiveness is really a positive thing in groups. It can be a very, very positive thing in groups, right? We want that group to be cohesive. We want that togetherness, that stick to and and the sense of, of belonging and connection in that group. We want that cohesiveness. And we also want concurrence seeking. We want groups to be on the same page, to, to look for concurrent solutions and look for things, uh, the ways that they can move forward in positivity together. So on one hand, these are both good things to have in a group. Cohesiveness and concurrency can, could potentially be good things to have in a group. The problem is when you get into excessive amounts of both, when you get into such extreme cohesiveness and extreme concurrence seeking, that, that people really don't have the ability to think independently anymore that they become so much a part of a group that they never stop to think if that group is wrong. Everything about the group is right. Everything about the group is number one. Everything is A-OK. -okay. And so uh, along with that, you have this kind of pressure to present a united front. You feel this pressure to be, you know, on the same page as the group, no matter what they say, and, and to be, you know, to, to justify jumping off that bridge, to make it seem like that's the right decision because that's what the group has decided, right? So we have this pressure to to present a united front. So when your mom says, you know, would they jump, if they jumped off the bridge, would you as well? You say, absolutely, because that's the right thing to do, because you're feeling that group pressure to do so, to present that united front. Right? So cohesiveness and concurrent seeking, when these things are excessive, when they run amok, that can be a problem. It sets those conditions, that perfect storm, so to speak, sets those conditions for groupthink, and we need to be cautious of that, right? So groupthink is really uh, the conditions are created when we have excessive amounts of co cohesiveness and concurrence seeking and that pressure to present that united front. When those are in place, then we will see uh, the effects of groupthink. So some things we can do to identify groupthink uh, in terms of identification of groupthink in these situations, um, there are a couple of things. First of all, we can look for an overestimation of that group's power and morality, uh, really sort of what we call an invincibility factor. When that group starts to think that they are invincible, um, that they are indestructible, then 
then we have the presence of a groupthink, probably. So one classic example would be the Titanic, you know, classically, that was the unsinkable ship, right? Except on its maiden voyage, what happened? It sank, right? The same kind of thing more recently here was with deep, the Deepwater Horizon oil uh, rig and oil well, oil platform, right? That, that caught on fire and exploded and caused, you know, millions of dollars and not only damages and death and things like that, but, but polluted the oil spill polluted thousands of, of square miles of, of, uh, of water and coastline and was very, very destructive in many ways. But And that came about because this group kind of felt like, well, we were indestructible. They had all the signs there that something was going wrong. Nope, nothing can go wrong with this. We've This, this rig is foolproof. It is indestructible. Things do not go wrong on these types of things. They overestimated uh, their own power and their own morality to make those types of decisions. right? And, and as a result... We had these horrendous, horrendous results with the loss of life and loss of animal life and, and, and destruction of, of ecology in that area. So when we have the overestimation of that group's power and morality, we can identify groupthink in many ways that way. Also have this closed-mindedness, right? This idea that this cannot happen to us, it will not happen to us, it's not us, it's not, you know, it's, it, this is not going to happen, you know. One of the more recent examples, uh, and maybe a little too recent examples, is that, you know kind of the Trump administration response to the coronavirus. This closed-mindedness, you know, within you know, months before the, the the real surge surge of this virus in the United States, we had the president saying it's sort of like the flu. It's not really coming here. It's more of a Chinese thing. It's not, you know, had this closed-mindedness to the idea that this could happen to us. Um, so just this unwillingness to accept that this is a possibility and that this was happening really until it was too late and a closed mindedness that led to uh, a lack of response, a timely response. And so we were caught shorthanded on supplies and different things like that as a, as a country. So um, at this closed mindedness, that's a big part of group think that, uh, that, you know, we think this cannot touch us. This will not affect our group. That is not, not us, you know, despite all the evidence to the contrary, it's not something that's going to affect us. So we can identify group think, uh, through closed-mindedness as well. And the last portion of identification here are that we start to see these, you know, pressures toward uniformity. Again, the pressure to be a part of the team, to, to not go against the team, and to, to present that united front. When we see that in overwhelming force, then we can identify groupthink as well. well one of the more famous examples, or, or prevalent examples, I guess I should say, is the, the idea of the Bay of Pigs invasion. When we had members of the Kennedy administration actually saying to people, no, you need to get on the same page here. This has been decided. This is so we've decided it's a good idea. So you're going to say it's a good idea. We all need to be on the same page and present this united front, whether you agree or disagree with it. Now you agree with it, right? This pressure toward uniformity uh, is, a, is an identification factor for groupthink as well. So when we see these things, we can identify groupthink by seeing these things, the over, overestimation of the group's power, the closed mindedness within that group and the pressure toward uniformity. When those things are present, we can identify groupthink in that manner. So if, if we know what it is and we can identify it, what can we do to prevent it, right? What can we do to avoid groupthink in groups that we're involved in? Well, you know, some simple things that we can do. Uh, first of all, we can be aware and we can recognize what's happening, right? We can be aware of groupthink and, and watch out for those signs that we just talked about in identification. We can also minimize status differences. We, groupthink really comes into play a lot of times, and that pressure comes into play when you have people in the group who are very different statuses. And, and this is kind of a you know low-hanging fruit example, but we look at the example of Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany. You know, uh, there was a huge status difference. He was obviously in charge of everything, and so everybody just kind of had to get on board, right? Nobody had the opportunity to object to what he was saying or to really question what he was saying or doing. Um, because it wasn't, you know, there was no opportunity. Their status was so much different than his that whatever he said went. Didn't matter what it was. So you had people then blindly following along. And, and you know, whether they agreed or not, they were doing what he said. And, and some agreed for sure, but others were, you know, reluctant uh, participants. And, but, but they were participants nonetheless. But we had that because of those massive status differences in that situation. So we can help prevent groupthink by making sure that everybody has more or less an equal status, has the ability to... To, to question and to object to what somebody else is doing in that group and, and to avoid that. So And that kind of dovetails into this last one. We can legitimize disagreement within the group. We can not only allow people to disagree, but we can encourage that. If somebody has questions or qualms about what's going on, we need to encourage that disagreement and say, if you have an issue, please speak up now and so we can avoid this. And you almost need, in some cases, someone to be assigned as the devil's advocate. 
to say, you know, is this the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? Should we be questioning? Is there another alternative? Let's look at some other possibilities. You almost really, in some ways, need to assign somebody to that role so that you can make sure that you have that disagreement and so that you can prevent uh, groupthink as a result, right? But we can prevent groupthink by doing these things, by being aware of it, first of all, so that we know that we uh, want to avoid it, by minimizing those status differences, and then by legitimizing that disagreement, allowing and, in fact, encouraging that disagreement so that we don't have people just kind of rushing toward the edge of that cliff together. At the end of this, what you really want uh, is for this old, old uh, Irving here to, to not say to you, well, what's wrong with these people? You want, to, you want them to not think, you know, what is going on with these people? But you want Dr. Janice to say, way to go, right? Give you the old thumbs up. Way to go. You've identified and avoided groupthink in your group decision making. If you have questions about this or any other topic related to small group communication, feel free to email me. I'd love to correspond with you via email and uh, encourage that and welcome that. In the meantime, happy communicating.